I wanted to introduce myself uh, before we introduce our wonderful speaker. Um, so for, um, hi, glad you can see it. Um, so my name is Dawn Carr. I'm the director of the Claude Pepper Center. And um, uh, I, I, I wanted to have just a couple of words before we started our talk today. Um, and, and I'll tell you a lot about Suzanne and why she's the perfect fit for being um, the first speaker, I think, for uh, as uh, for me as director at the Club Pepper Center. So I've, I've been the director now for just a handful of months, and I'm really honored to be here. Um, and uh, just to give you an idea, as, as I um, have settled in here, I've been at FSU since 2016, and it's just a wonderful time. Um, if you're here at FSU, it's just a, a, a magical time with all kinds of exciting new things happening. Um, so the, the CPC, the Claude Pepper Center, its goal is to identify policy solutions um, to, to enhance um, financial, psychological, cognitive, physical, and social well-being. And, um, and, and we're thinking the work is, is meant to both look at uh, supporting older adults and their families across the life course. And we're thinking uh, all of our efforts are really focused on trying to both address the needs directly of people living in Florida and try to serve as um, a place where we can serve our community, uh, but also federally being able to extend these things. So you'll hear why uh, the work that Suzanne Kunkel has done is such a great fit for supporting that um, mission. But the, the Pepper Building is a, is a pretty cool place and we have lots of great things happening here. Um, and we're, we're working together as a team to take on a lot of these same and similar missions. So I thought it would be really helpful to think in those terms. Um, so the Claude Pepper Center is here and the Claude Pepper Building and the Institute, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about all that, um, is here because of Claude Pepper. And um, he was a, a, a legislator, a, an important figure in our, our US history. And we're, we're lucky that he not only provided leadership to uh, the nation in terms of um, making older adults, uh, their well-being a critical policy issue and did all kinds of really critical things to change actual policy. Um, and, but also to be the kind of citizen I think we should all aspire to be uh, because he really was here to try to help make the world a better place. And I really think that's what we try to do here in this building with a lot of the work that we're doing. Um, so I want to just recognize a couple of people that are part of this team. First, I want to acknowledge Miles Taylor, who's um, my uh, partner in crime here, the um, director of the Pepper Institute on Aging and Public Policy, and um, in many ways, the reason that I came here. So uh, so the if you don't know this area, we have the Pepper Institute and the Pepper Center in the building. We also have the Pepper Foundation that's also in this building. Um, and the director of the Pepper Foundation is Tom Spulak, um, and he has done such an amazing job being able to um, provide the supports for these, for FSU. Uh, he's an FSU law alumni, um, alumnus, and uh, still teaches at the law school uh, in the spring every year. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge some other things. So we're going to have our reception today in the uh, Pepper Museum. So if you haven't been there before, this will be your opportunity to go in. And we have our wonderful librarian who's here, Robert uh, Rivero. And you can ask him all kinds of great questions. He gave us a great tour and I learned all kinds of things I didn't know I needed to know about Club Pepper. Um, and we also have in this building our uh, the, the Mildred and Claude Pepper Eminence Scholar, Anne Garrett, who's doing all kinds of great work um, and representing a lot of the, the mission that Claude Pepper had in terms of supporting and addressing issues related to, to age and inequalities. I won't go into great detail, but you should talk to her about her amazing research. Um, and then I want to acknowledge Rima Nathan. For me, uh, one of the other new exciting things that I wanted to, to sort of mention is we have a new Claude Pepper elder, elder Law Clinic that has just begun. It's a really exciting new thing. Uh, you should learn more about it, but there, it, there's an interdisciplinary component. So if you're um, a graduate student in social sciences, you have an opportunity to learn uh, about several important legal issues related to elder law. Um, and this is just a really uh, neat 
um, venture that I'm just really honored to be able to be a part of. So Rima's here and thank you. Um, I also want to acknowledge the Institute for Successful Longevity. So in addition to this building, we also have important other aging going on and we're part of the same team trying to do important work. And so the director, uh, Neil Tarnas and assistant director, Lily Booter here, and um, we have a great partnership also doing things across campus. So we're, we're in the social sciences college here, but um, the Institute for Successful Longevity provides reach all across campus. And that's such an important part of what we're able to do here at FSU with aging. Um, so uh, after giving you the, the grand tour, I wanted to uh, just give you a sense of why this kind of work is so important and, and kind of what we're trying to do. Um, as I introduce to you, Suzanne Kunkel, who is here to kind of, I think, kick off what I hope is another exciting phase for FSU and with aging in particular, um, our interest and excitement around doing really impactful work, research that, that changes the lives of older adults and how we age. Um, so Suzanne recently retired, um, and, and we'll explain unsuccessfully, um, <laughs> but uh, as the executive director of the uh, Scripps Gerontology Center at Miami University. So she was in this role for 24 years and a professor before that and um, had been there, has been a huge centerpiece for what the Scripps Gerontology Center is and what it's become over all of these decades. Um, her teaching and research focuses on lots of things, um, including demography of aging, um, the links between community-based programs and social needs, uh, issues related to social determinants of health. Um, uh, she does a lot too on, uh, and she'll talk a little about this, on the impact of cross-sector um, partnerships, uh, including at county level population, looking at some of the projections, and she'll show you some projection research, um, and lots of work on evaluation of, of programs and all the programs in the state of Ohio. So many of them, um, the evidence of behind why they're successful are due to the work that she and her team of scholars have done. So all of these things are great. I, I won't enumerate the, the, the millions of grant dollars she's had and, and the editorial boards and all the different service she's done for the field of gerontology, um, but uh, suffice it to say, um, she's one of the most uh, well-recognized and well-respected gerontologists in the country. So it's such an honor for you to join us. So thank you and please help me welcome her. Oh. Okay, so let's make sure we have this. All right. Okay. okay, we're good to go. Thank you, Dawn, for that wonderful introduction. And thanks to all of you for being here. I This really is such an honor to um, sort of see the generations of gerontologists blooming before my very eyes. And so I, it's, it's great to see old friends, uh, Marshall Kapp from Ohio, Susan Sally, uh, uh, Sheila Salyer, who got an undergraduate degree in gerontology at Miami University in 1981. I was there at the time. We had to have crossed paths. So I love the Miami University connection. I love the generations of gerontologists. And I, and I do want to acknowledge my colleague and partner, Bob Applebaum, who's uh, really responsible for a lot of the success we've had at the Scripps Gerontology Center. And I forgot to tell you this, but I might ask you to stand up and say a few things at some point, but I'll let you know. I also want to say how happy I am to meet new friends, uh, gerontologists from Florida State. Uh, and, and I look forward to those of you I haven't gotten a chance to talk with. I do look forward to chatting some at the reception. But I, it's been a great visit so far. I hope the next hour goes just fine. <laughs> I guess that's up to me. But I, I just am so energized by talking with the students, frankly. I'm just so optimistic about what's possible thanks to you guys and your interest and your energy. And for Florida State, I can't imagine a more dynamic duo than Don and Miles to take the Pepper Enterprise to its next level. They're still struggling for a name. Pepper Franchise, Pepper Powerhouse. I thought about have a Pepper Mill. <laughs> anyway, I'm, I'm, you're in great hands. Uh, so thanks for having me. I'm delighted to be here. I. Don asked me to, well, Don asked me to do a lot of things. I don't know if those of you who work with Don know she, she's ambitious for herself and for the rest of us. So I had a long list, 
But the, the basic message is, as she suggested, is to talk about the value of applied research and, and the role that it can play for an academic institution in gerontology and to even some extent the obligation that we have as people who study aging, as gerontologists, to do work that makes a difference. So that's really the focus of my, hmm. so that's not working. That's because we tested it six times. We did, we tested six times. So the, yeah, it's definitely not working. Um, so what I, what I wanna talk about today, I really wanna make the case for the value of applied research for an institution, for a particular organization within that institution, and perhaps for individual scholars. So I, I, that's, that's really my, my main focus. Um, I guess I, it, it occurred to me, we've been talking about applied research for two days now, and we haven't really ever defined it. So I thought I would just say, what I mean by applied research is research that is stakeholder responsive research that is designed to be relevant to policy and to practice. I had a great conversation with students, great questions about sort of, you know, what, how does that contrast with um, sort of investigator initiated research? And we will talk a little bit more about that, but it was a great conversation. But the bottom line is applied research is designed to make a difference in a particular kind of way. All research, all good research should make a difference somehow, some way, but we're talking about research that makes a difference in the lives of aging adults, their families, and their communities. So I wanna talk, I wanna, I wanna help make that case. I wanna talk a little bit about what it takes to build an infrastructure for applied research and what it takes to build a culture for applied research. I mean, it's just a few ideas about what might work. If I if I had the answer, I would I would write a book about it. But that's uh, that's not the case. And then I want to give you a few examples from the Scripture Ontology Center of what I think are sort of exemplary um, illustrations of our commitment to applied research and the many forms that that can take, including publications in scholarly journals. Which, um, again, hearkening back to my conversations with some of you. Um, I do want to tell you a little bit about the Scripps Gerontology Center. Uh, we just celebrated our 100th anniversary. We were established in 1922 by E.W. Scripps, but he established the Scripps Foundation for Research and Population Problems. And that was because E.W. Scripps is the, that's the name, it's the name of a multi-conglomerate media empire these days, but it started with E.W who began something called the Penny Newspaper. He was committed, and this was in like the late 1800s. He thought information should be available to ev everybody so that everybody can be informed, everybody can make good decisions. So he started the Penny Newspaper. That resonates with us at the Scripps Ontology Center today because that is what we want, to produce information that gets into the hands of people who can use it to make good decisions. The Scripps uh, logo, the Scripps um, Multimedia Enterprise logo is a, is, a, is a lighthouse, and the motto is give light and people will find their way. I, th I think that's optimistic. I think it's exactly the right message, though. All, our job as researchers, as applied researchers, is to provide information that sheds light, that allows people to make informed decisions. So our, our history is really important. The first several decades, the work that was done was demographic work. In fact, some of the most innovative and really groundbreaking and um, still relevant demographic research in the country was done at Scripps. Uh, the, the method that is used by the Census Bureau today to project population is that was that method was developed by, by the researchers in the early years of the Scripps Foundation. They, I, always, I have to tell this story because I think it's so remarkable. They also, so they were all about projecting populations and their, and their, whole, their whole issue at first was the idea that the population was gonna grow and grow so big that we not, might not be able to sustain it. Um, it was an old fashioned Malthusian idea that population grows exponentially, but our ability to provide subsistence to that population only grows arithmetically. It turns out that's not true. Human beings aren't quite resourceful in being able to come up with new ways to produce things. But that's what that's what EW Scripps started, the Scripps Foundation, because he was very concerned about that. 
So the, the first two leaders, um, Welton and Thompson, were very invested in, in projecting population. Like how big is it gonna grow? How fast is it gonna grow? I'll spare you some of the details, but one of the trickiest things I know, and I know some of you in the room are demographers, one of the trickiest things about project, projecting population is fertility. How many kids are women gonna have? And the traditional way of, of estimating what was gonna happen with mortality was, I mean, fertility was to just sort of track what has been happening and maybe make some adjustments, some assumptions. Well, Thompson and Welton decided that maybe, here's a radical idea, we could ask women about their fertility intentions. So they did, they launched a survey, the, Sur the Growth of American Family Survey, was the first time that survey research methods were used to improve um, population projections. You can tell we're pr very, very proud of that history. Um, also really proud of the visionary leaders who in the 1960s and 70s changed our focus from population problems in general to the fact that our population was aging, because in fact, the population did grow, and then the population began to grow older. There were also public policies being um, that got instituted, Older Americans Act, Medicare, Medicaid in the mid-1960s. Mid so there was a lot going on to suggest that aging was the thing to pay attention to, and where were they right? So um, we officially changed our name to the Scripture Ontology Center in 1972, and we have never looked back. What we have done is built on that vision and built on that commitment to preparing our society for the aging population by investing heavily in applied research. We are at this point, a largely grant funded, self-funded organization. We generate about 80% of our own, our own revenue. About uh, our operating budget is about $3 million a year and we generate 80% of that through grants and contracts. It means we're always hungry. It means we're always looking for opportunities. And it means we really rely on our partners and our communities to help us know what's the next big question, what should we be focusing on? So being able to talk about the applied research that we do because of that focus, because of that commitment is, is really an honor. Our mission, I've already said our mission, I didn't tell you it was our mission, but it is to do work that makes a positive difference in the lives of older aging adults, their families and their communities. And that mission drives what we decide to do and who we, and who we do it for. I, I wanted to start with this slide for several reasons. So first of all, how many of you know about the Aging Network and area agencies on aging? Some, some of you do, <laughs> pardon me. Well, so the, for those of you who don't, it, the Aging Network is a system of, a, a network of community-based organizations. Every community in the United States has an area agency on aging that links older people to services that are available to them and helps, and helps establish eligibility for certain programs. So these are the agencies that really are the, they, they provide the linkage to other services in the community. We do a lot of work with the area agencies on aging, and that's why I wanted you to know who they are. I'll be mentioning them later. But I put up this slide for a reason. So this is the Facebook page, homepage, of the Ohio Association of Area Agencies on Aging. They just changed it to this. And the reason, I, I like this for many reasons. Um, and it, it is a quote from a book by Becca Levy. The gerontology students probably, or sociology and gerontology students, you may know who Becca Levy is. She's a psychologist at Yale, professor of psychology at Yale and a professor of public health at Yale. And she's done all kinds of work on ageism and the effects of ageism on people's health and well-being. And I think, I love the fact that an area agency, an association of area agencies on aging is quoting an academic to, to spread the message that they themselves also stand behind. And that is to make sure that our communities value older people for who they are. It's a passion that she has. It's a passion that this organization has. It's a passion that we have. And it's one I'm gonna come back to. But I, I think that it just exemplifies for me the natural connection between the work we do as academics and scholars in gerontology 
and what the world needs out there in the provision of services. And we have the same message. So why do, why do this work? Um, and and there are, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some challenges because it's, it's not without its challenges to be sure. But again, for us, it is, it is the easiest way to do work that makes a difference. To have stakeholders, to have partners, to have organizations, to have legislators who care about what we have to say is, is the right way to do work that makes a difference. We know that our work is gonna be used. It gives our organization good visibility in so many different arenas. And it also helps us with that outward and forward focus that is that really is the hallmark of who we are and what we do, thanks to the leaders who got us in this direction. I did I do want to talk, I want to acknowledge a few challenges along with the values. And the, my first one is probably the most important one. The great value of doing applied research is it matters to stakeholders, and the big challenge is it matters to stakeholders. So they're they want it, they want to know what we find and they want to have something to say about what we find, which does make it a challenge. In my I teach an evaluation research class and I talk a lot about evaluation research as art, science, and politics. It's a, a lot of us got trained in the science of research. Evaluation research, applied research is has many different layers to it. It is the art of communicating, negotiating, compromising without ever giving up your standards as a researcher. So there is a way, there is a way to do it, but you have to be comfortable with this model. And I shared with the students my sort of um, epiphany the first time I was involved in an applied research project. It, it gave me an entirely different perspective on my role as a researcher. I am one of the one of the people with expertise in the room, but I'm not the only person with expertise in the room. The case managers who are telling me what their pain points are, the director of the agency who's saying we can't afford to keep doing it this way. There are a lot of people with expertise, and I think that at least the, in the old days, the traditional mode of being trained as a researcher was you have your toolbox now, go go fix something. But that is not how it works. Another value is that it, it does give us visibility. We we have um, tried to, we have established ourselves as a go-to organization for answering questions from our stakeholders. It has positioned us very well um, in, in the field and also in our state and at our university. But the corollary to that is then your the people who also recognize you as those experts, they expect they expect things from you. They, they need things from you. They want things from you. And I think this, this is one of the biggest challenges that we've discussed in a couple of settings since we've been here. And that is how, how do you balance priorities? How do you balance your own questions that you derive based on your deep knowledge of a field of study and the questions that your stakeholders need answered? And truly, probably one of the biggest challenges is the value of peer reviewed journal articles for people in academia doesn't always align with what we have to produce for our stakeholders who don't want a peer reviewed, they don't care about a peer reviewed journal article, they don't want to read a peer reviewed journal article, they need a brief report that summarizes the key highlights and the policy implications. So we've built this, we've, we've built our portfolio very intentionally so that we consider what's the balance what's the right balance if we do this project for one of our stakeholders are we going to be able to turn it into a journal article and the answer can't be no every time or we won't we, we cannot we cannot do that the other thing that i would um i can't emphasize enough and again this has come up in several conversations when we enter into contracts with some of our stakeholders with all of our stakeholders we pay very close attention to the language about who owns the data um, we, we have some challenges with the state of Ohio at the moment with reports sitting in somebody's office waiting to be read by lots of people who apparently are concerned that it might have implications and somebody might be upset, but it's, it's, that's a roadblock for us. We, we can't afford to do work that sits on someone's shelf. We, we have to produce work that gets into the hands of people who need it and can use it. So one of the ways we've done this on other contracts is to build it in to say we have the right to use the data for research other than the project, and we have the right to release reports. So we'll see how that goes in our conversations with the state of Ohio going forward. 
Um, and the last value challenge um, comparison I want to make is about the partnerships. So the great value of stakeholder responsive research is that it does build partnerships. It builds networks. The, with the students and I were talking about the how the, it links you into networks of service providers, service planners, decision makers that may be the door to your your next your next job opportunity or your, the next step in your career. So, and those networks are really, really important. Those partnerships are really, really important. And it, again, it doesn't just happen. It doesn't, it takes, it takes work. It takes intentionality. It takes very skilled uh, relationship builders like Bob Applebaum. Okay, I'll, I'll, you want me to read it to you? <laughs> So the one, again, sort of what we've learned along the way, the, the value to, to maximize the value of the partnerships is to try to make sure there's no big surprises for anybody along the way. We don't want to be surprised by what they're expecting or what they're intending to do. We don't want them to be surprised by anything that, that we're finding as we're doing our research. There are no surprises open communication, clear roles, clear um, communication of those roles and expectations. One of the other things that's worked really well for us in terms of maintaining these amazing partnerships is uh, bringing in students. <clears throat> and I know that you guys have a strong commitment to giving students the, the kinds of experience that they need to be in position for their next, for their next step. We, a lot of our research partners also have our, our, house our students for their internships or their, or their summer practicum. So it's another way of just deepening the connections. Um, so somewhere in here, I was, um, I, I don't remember which slide it was on, but I didn't say it, I need to say it. One, the, the, the good news is the work matters, they care about it. The, the bad news is the work matters, they care about it. We are very clear very, very clear about what it takes to maintain research integrity. We are not going to, of course, we're not going to fudge the results. That's not even on the table. But there are times when what the partner wants is so unrealistic in the time that they're giving us and the money that they're giving us, we have to say no. So that that's hard. But we have to do that to, again, to maintain our reputation, which is our most important asset. So I want to um, relatively quickly go through three examples from the work at Scripps. One is our work with the state of Ohio. Another one is our sort of continuing our demographic history, um, our demographic legacy. And then last, um, a bit about our work with the Aging Network, which has turned into um, some really exciting scholarly collaborations as well. So our work with the state of Ohio, and this is Bob has been running this, um, running the show with our state presence for I don't know a lot of, a lot of years. One of the things that we do is track use of long term care services in the state of Ohio. We do a biennial survey of all the long term care and residential care facilities in the state of Ohio. We do satisfaction surveys for family members and residents of long term care facilities. So we we really are the state experts on long term care in Ohio. But this tracking long term services and supports project um, is is important and interesting in so many ways. One of which is in order to do that project, we get data from well our own survey, but also Medicaid and aging and health. Department of Health, three state departments that give us their data, but they don't give each other their data. So that's a really good, and um, Don has been leading some conversation about that here at the state of Florida. Um, the other thing I, I wanna mention about, I'm gonna show you an example of some of the things that we were able to be part of, big changes in the state of Ohio, but I also wanna mention that this, is supported by a line item in Miami University's budget that the legislators vote on, approve every, every budget period. So we do not ever take this for granted. It's an enormously helpful sort of uh, foundation for us. It sort of gives us some grounding so that if we're, if we're in between grants, but we've got this great researcher we don't wanna lose, we're able to use the long-term care money to come up with a project that they can do while we're bridging them to the next 
to the next project. So it's been extremely important for that reason and for many other reasons, because it lets us be, it lets us be at the forefront of long-term care research in the state. But it's we don't, we never take it for granted. So we are present with the legislature in multiple ways. Um, Bob testifies before legislative committees all the time. We also have an annual a dissemination plan of things that we want that we send to the legislators that are relevant to the to the work that they're doing. So we, we try to stay in front of them and, and in ways that we're providing them not with a 35 page report with 150 references. It's there are two page reports, there are highlights, there are, here's some, you know, here's the facts you need to know about this. So we really are very conscious about how important they are to us and how important we need to be to them. And that is what we try to do. We try to make it clear how much we can be of use to them. And knock on wood, this has been going on for a while. Well, here's one of the one of the things that we were able to track and actually help influence. So this slide shows the proportion of long-term care services that are provided in nursing homes as opposed to in home and community care services. I, I'm, I, love, I love the naughty heads. Like <laughs> you like data. I know you like data. <laughs> Pardon? Yeah, well, we, it's good news for the state of Ohio when, the, as we can see, the first year here where we were reporting data, nine percent, only nine percent of long-term care services were provided in the community. Ninety-one percent were provided in nursing homes. Nobody thought that was a good idea. Certainly, families and older people themselves didn't think it was a good idea. The cost of it was made it absolutely not not a good option. The quality of it made it sometimes not a good choice. So there was a movement to move ahead to home and community-based services. And we collectively, um, Bob and his team, did a lot of work to help provide information about who, use, who uses long-term care, how much does it cost in its different forms, what is it that consumers want. And we're part of the conversation at the state, which actually did result in some big changes, including the Medicaid waiver that allows people to receive nursing home levels of care in their own homes for as long as possible. And so now uh, in 2019, it was it was closer to 50-50. And, and the balance was actually now on the home and community based services side. So it's a very it's a very positive story. And our ability to provide the data to show how the state was doing when we and we knew that the state was interested in doing something, um, I think played a played a major role. Somebody really wants to go. Uh, okay, I want to spend a few minutes talking about the Ohio Population Research Project. This one is near and dear to my heart. I, my degree is in demography. So I love the fact that we're retaining that, that um, strength at the Scripps Gerontology Center. So this is, uh, this is a, it's a, it's a website I'm gonna show you, but it started before there was such a thing as a website. We, but we have been doing projections of the older population in Ohio since the 1980 census, actually. Um, in those days, you had to wait five years to get the census data. So I think our first published report was almost at the time the next census came around. But we have been doing these projections. And it's not just for the state. We do projections by county. And we now are doing much, much more. But again, this was... This was something we knew would be useful to service providers and planners, and we hoped, fondly hoped, for legislators. One of the projects we did when we were still doing everything by paper and um, much more complicated ways of, of actually doing the population projections, we packaged county reports for legislators based on their legislative districts so that they could see in the counties where, where their voters live, here's what's happening with the growth of the older population. Well, we've now moved to a pretty cool online resource. This is by this is one of our probably best utilized products, our, our population, our population projections. So this is an interactive data center. It's the um, I'm not going to go through all of the details, but I just want to show you some of the things that are available. So we have state and uh, we have state and county reports. We have maps that show. I'll show you the state and county reports. So this is for all 88 counties. 
we have a report that describes the size of the older population, the growth of the older population, the size of the 85 plus population, the percent who live in poverty, the percent who live alone, all of those demo demographic characteristics that can that matter a lot to service providers and planners in those regions. Uh, all of these can be downloaded. You can look at them online. Um, okay, here we go. Uh, so two other things I want to show you. One is that our, our maps. So we do we do these these maps, and I'll show you just one of them. But basically, what we do are create maps where each county is color coded based on the proportion of its population that is 60 plus, 65 plus, or 85 plus. And we use those three age breakdowns for um, probably obvious reasons, 60 plus eligibility for some programs, 65 plus eligibility for other programs, 85 plus likelihood of a disability. But this shows at a glance, I mean, first of all, you can get, you can get the exact details for your county, but you can see at a glance, the state of Ohio is getting greener um, and the more green, the older the population. So you can compare your county to other counties in the interactive data center, which I'm going to go to in just a minute, you can pull up any of these maps and click on a county and it'll tell you, give you the details for that county. But we made these downloadable because we've been doing these now for, I don't know, 10 years, I would say. I think. Um, and when we first started doing them, they were showing up in in all the off state offices that had anything to do with aging. And we go to Columbus and we went into the ARP office for a meeting and they had the maps and like a big blown up map on, a, on an easel because it helped tell their story. So the only other thing, I just wanna quickly show you the interactive data center. Um, this is, this has been this has been a, a labor of love and uh, definitely a challenge. I mean, definitely took us to the next level. And sorry, to, there we go. So you can look at the older population. You can look. Here's an interactive map where you can click on each county and see how many, what proportion of older people. You can break it down by by gender if you so choose. But there are. This is probably my favorite. So this is um, all different ways to show the change in the size of the older population, the proportion of the population that's a certain age, like any good demographer, I love population pyramids. You guys like them too. So here we have the state of Ohio and we can see, let's see. Um, need my glasses for this, sorry. I want you to be able to see the whole pyramid change. You can watch what happens to the state of Ohio between 2010 and 2050 as the older population grows and grows as a proportion of the population. You can do this for any county. Um, so as I said, this is a, this is a very popular product for us. Uh, and one that is, that is widely used. Oh, okay, so then here's an older version of our maps. And the only reason I wanted to, so again, stakeholder responsive research. So our first sets of, of, of maps used yellow, orange, and red. And wow, Ohio was really red in 2040. The Department of Aging, and I think they were absolutely right about that. They said, why is it red? Red usually means stop, red, red usually means caution, bad. So while this is way more dramatic, it also is sending a negative message and they were right and we changed, we changed the colors that we use. Um, the last thing I wanna talk about is a little bit of work that um, is near and dear to my heart, working with the area agencies on aging and focusing on programs and services that they provide and how they have an impact on the health, well-being, and independence of older people in their communities. We do several things. We do a national survey of all of the area agencies on aging. We do a national survey of all the Title VI programs that serve tribal elders. We are working with U.S. Aging on their Technical Assistance Center, which is helping area agencies on aging take it to the next step and contract with healthcare, convincing healthcare providers to pay the area agencies to provide social support services that will prevent 
unnecessary expenditures and unnecessary healthcare use and unnecessary negative health outcomes. This is a really exciting time for the aging network. It's a really exciting time for those of us committed to home and community-based services. And it's, it's interesting. It's very interesting working with the healthcare providers and payers and managed care plans is, is a challenge, but we're right in there helping make this happen. Because of all this work we've been doing with US aging on the role of AAAs in their communities, we are now in a, in a research partnership with um, some researchers at Yale University, Leslie Curry in public health, and Amanda Brewster at UC Berkeley. And what that those what th this endeavor is is a complicated combination of data sets about what is the area agency doing in your in a community and what do the health outcomes look like for people in that community. And we've got, I, I just have two examples of um, relatively recent pub publications that showed AAAs that are deeply embedded, highly partnered in their communities, that those counties have better health outcomes, avoidable um, nursing home use, re reduction in low need nursing home use, some reduction in actually Medicare expenditures. And um, this, the, the other article talks about specific programs that actually also reduce unnecessary low need nursing home use and um, uh, healthcare costs. So this, I, I wanted to mention this as a way of saying these partnerships this apply, applied research can result in also sort of a stepped up academic uh, publication portfolio. So I can't say enough about the value of applied research. Uh, well, I, I guess I can't say enough and I think I almost have. <laughs> but I, I do, and I wanna say, you know, just a little bit of reflection on what it takes. I mean, in my conversations with Don and Miles, this, these are some of the things that they wanted to talk about. And our line item really, really helps. And we work hard to maintain that line item. Champions, champions at our university, champ, our, our governmental um, relations person for the university is a tremendous support. Within our organization, we, we, we do have someone who's incredibly skilled at establishing and maintaining relationships. This is the most nice stuff I've said about Bob Applebaum ever. In <laughs> <laughs> but it's all true. Um, and then building, finding those champions in the legislature who, who, who are ready to hear the story of what needs to happen to make, to make it possible for all people to live their lives with dignity, respect, independence, and, and well-being. It, it's finding those champions and, and building this together that, that allowed us to do what we do. One of the big challenges is getting faculty who want to be part of this. Um, because again, that tension between, well, I need to do my peer reviewed artic articles, I need to do my NIA proposal, I don't have time to work on this website for the, for the legislators. Well, there, there are solutions to that. And again, we've been, we've been talking about that. Having the right staff resources, having the right infrastructure is key. We have a full-time person at the Scripps Gerontology Center who, it, who handles all of our grant budgets. She handles, she, she, sub, she pushes the button to submit our grants through the, through the system that Miami has. She, she helps us with pre-award, she helps us with post-award. We have, we are so fortunate to have built that capacity internally. Um, Miami is working hard to step up their capacity across the university, but we, we can't wait. And we've, we've benefited enormously from having that infrastructure. We have full-time researchers. They're not, they're not faculty members. They're full-time researchers hired to help us get this work done. And again, um, that building that is really important. The other the last thing is I think the, especially for when we're thinking about faculty buy-in, but also how a center or a unit within the university is measured, I think it is, what are your measures of success and how much appetite is there for the kinds of measures that really do matter for an applied research center? How many times were you in the media in a good way? Um, who, who's calling on you to, to do testimony? Uh, how, many, how many reports did you put before the legislature? How many organizations are wanting to continue to work with you? There, there are, how many organizations are using your work? How many uh, hits do we have for our population website? These are not traditional measures of success, so it does, but it, this is what matters. The involvement in community gerontology, public gerontology, being involved in 
efforts to make a true difference in the lives of older people, their families, and their communities. Um, I am, I'm going to stop here. I, 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 ageism is hugely important as on our agenda now, dealing with ageism as a component of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I like to place it in the context of what I think is the bigger word, which is belonging. This is about people feeling like they belong in their community for as long as they can live there in a healthy and safe way. It is about belonging. And we have a lot of work to do and we are investing in this now. And it's not, we are working on publications, but we're also working with work organizations that want to um, learn more about what kinds of ageism might be operating in our workplace that we are not even aware of. So we have developed an ageism, what's called the Age Smart Inventory. It's a series of questions. It doesn't, it doesn't give you a score to say, wow, you are really ageist, that's bad. But it, but it's questions that generate conversation. And I I will save that for my next for my next visit. Because I do want to save time and I'll stop here and just say thank you for, and those of you who've heard almost the same exact thing twice, thank you for continuing to pay attention. And thanks to the rest of you. And let's have questions. Anybody, anybody here have questions or comments? Yes. With the like interactive, um, like the, the website, all that kind of stuff, I know in the sociology department, we talked about like displaying data and like using sorts of like um, programs to do that. I was kind of curious if you, um, if it was like a proprietary program or if it was like something like Tableau that you used to make yourself. A great question. And uh, this was a conversation I, I had with someone else in the audience last night. Um, we use our shiny for the interactive data center. We're in a bit of a pickle because the graduate student who was the expert in our shiny graduated. <laughs> they do that sometimes. <laughs> but we don't have the internal capacity. So we've got to figure out how we're going to, because now the, the new census data, county cent level, level census data at the level of age detail that we need is is about to be released and we want to be ready to go. So the interactive portion of the data of the of this website is tricky. And we looked at Tableau, but it's it's very static. Mm -hmm. So I'll read it uh, out loud, mm -hmm. but you can see here. Um, so we have a, um, a question about um, a Florida County report. So mm -hmm. suggestions for beyond it. As far as I know, does anyone in the audience know if Florida has a uh, population yeah. county. So, yeah, what you're referring to. I think a roughly equivalent version of this was was the question. The Department of Elder Affairs has uh, somewhat of it on their website. County specific numbers? Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't know if they have much of the interactive map. I been on there recently. So I think the answer, if you can't yeah. hear that online, is that there are some numbers, not necessarily interactive, engaging reports that are ones we can play with. Yes. So not interactive. And the other thing that I that I didn't really show you that our, our county reports that are PDFs, not interactive. Well, and, and actually some of the interactive stuff is how many, what proportion of the population are grandparents caring for grandkids? Um, but, we, but our county reports also include things like poverty, other data sets that we have to go to to, to get that besides, the, besides ACS. So I, I don't, it sounds like you can get your county numbers in Florida, but may need to do a little more work because the other question was how can we how can we do that? Yeah, and that would be a question for Don Carr and Miles Taylor to answer. How <laughs> many others? But not right this minute. Not right this minute. Yes. So, um, are there other questions? Yes. So we've heard a lot of stakeholders in the same space about the need to have um, often have the perspective of maybe depersonalizing elders when talking about policy decisions and really changing it into conversation almost exclusively about money, savings, et cetera. Researcher as a leader, how do you navigate that? Do you push back? Thankfully, cost savings often comes with better care, but absolutely absolutely we would push back and have pushed back on, on those reductionistic uh, formulas for how to make a decision and not to underplay at all the role that organizations like area agencies can play in those conversations. So we can present the numbers. Um, 
yeah, if, if we find out that home and community-based services actually doesn't save money, then it's, it's, we can change the question. Are we spending money? Can we spend money smarter? Can we have better outcomes for the individual? So we can help change the conversation that way. But in terms of conv being convincing to legislators, probably one of the most compelling things I ever heard about was the te testimony provided by Meals on Wheels, Home Delivered Meals on Wheels recipients. And one woman saying in front of this committee, if it weren't for my, if it weren't for my driver who delivers my meals, no one's gonna know when I die. I mean, it was, this has been a long time ago, but it still sticks with me. But th those kinds of stories about what, how this makes a difference to real life people. And even some of, we do some qualitative, we do a fair amount of qualitative work to help, again, tell the depth of the story and not just the numbers. You know, I do everything I can to change the conversation. Oh, uh -huh. for, for your beautiful county by county maps, um, I'm curious how aging prison populations do or don't fit into those, and if that's data that's available to you, or how, how do you navigate that? It, it is, and actually, we we often talk about the Noble County problem because Noble County always was a, was stood out in the state of Ohio because they were aging faster, they were they were older. And we thought, well, what's going on? Well, there's a there's a prison there, and that's but we still report it because that that's where they live, and they are aging, and and that raises another issue of what are we doing with aging prison populations? But yes, we do pay attention to that. And did you get that data from which agency? I don't know. Was that included in stuff that you received, or is that like a separate? I believe box? we called someone in Noble County to, to say, well, "Can you help us understand what's going on?" Because we none of us knew Noble County. Is that, is that right, Bob? What, did we end up making a call, and maybe to a county commissioner, or it could have been to the area agency for that region because it was it was a mystery. Um, yes. So thank you for your talk, learned a lot. Uh, so specifically in reference to the county by county breakdowns, like the reports that you were speaking about, uh, as you had kind of mentioned, there are a lot of different kinds of stakeholders that are going to use those reports to accomplish whatever they're trying to accomplish. Uh, in some ways you can and cannot predict. So uh, have you, when you think about that and like how to be strategic about prepping those reports, like the kinds of language you use, like is there a specific approach you take? Um, if so, like what is it? It's such a great question because yes, indeed, those numbers can be and are used in, in lots of different ways. One of the things we try to be really careful about is the uh, ap apocalyptic demography problem to say to legislators, oh my God, look at this, look at all these old people, what are we going to do? It's a silver tsunami. We do not use that language. We are truly committed to avoiding ageist presentations. The apocalyptic demography thing is tricky because it does get their attention, <laughs> but we don't, we, we do not embrace that and we are just trying to, we use some of the um, reframing aging um, language that, that the Gerontological Society and other organizations are promoting. So uh, to talk about, to say we are aging instead of our, that aging population is getting so darn big. We are aging as a state. We have an opportunity. So we, we do try to use language that prevents, what well, at least prevents us from sounding like we're being ageist and negative. And it's not easy. We have habits, bad habits. Other questions? All righty. So before we thank Suzanne, I just wanted to, um, and thank you. Um, we have a reception. We'd love to have you stay and ask more questions in person, meet all the many people that I tried to introduce. All of you are, um, I hope, can talk more about uh, maybe in, inspired by some of these ideas. Um, things we can do here at FSU, um, but there's we have a reception that's co-sponsored um, by the Institute for Successful Longevity. We'd sure love for you to stay and visit and talk, and that's in the Pepper Library, so make sure that you stay and visit, say hello, take a look at the Pepper Library, but um, so, so we can continue the conversation, but thank you. We can join 
together and thanking Suzanne. Thanks, everybody.